<clears throat> okay. So you'll again. Some of this is going to be on the whiteboard, so you won't see. You'll you'll hear it in the video, but you won't see part of it. Um, but at any rate, uh, what I'd like everybody to do is just do a new file for me. So Command N to just open up a brand new file. Uh, it doesn't matter what size it is. And I want you to um, come up to the uh, edit menu, come down to fill, and pick 50% gray. Oh, wait, you guys, that's your screen, actually. Let me plug this into mine. Okay. So anyway, um, so up to the edit menu down to fill and fill this with 50% gray, 100% opacity, normal blending mode, go ahead and say okay to that. Uh, it fills it with gray and then simply make a duplicate of this. Yep, so you have two layers, they're both 50% gray. To make sure that you know that they are 50% gray, I want you to actually come over, we're gonna add a color sampler tool to this. So go ahead and I'm gonna click one up here at the top and then I'm gonna click a second one down here at the bottom. Um, just so I've got two points on here. You can see in your readouts that you're getting 128. Um, you know, let me turn off these lights really quick or maybe change which ones are on. Oh, wait, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, and so you can see that the value that they have here for middle gray is 128. However, you cannot actually have a perfect middle gray in a digital world. Why not? Because what? It does not exist in a digital world. And I ask why doesn't a perfect middle gray exist in a digital world? Think about it. In a digital world, when we talk about bit depth, we talk about how many tones that are possible for an image, right? So if you have a one-bit image, how many possible tones do you have? Two, either black or white, right? If you have a two-bit image, how many do you have? Four. If you have an eight-bit image, how many do you have? No, 256. Uh, anyway, it's always even numbers, right? So in the case of middle gray, or the, what we would consider to be middle gray, if you look at our scale from 0 to 255 is the scale from black to white in Photoshop. From 0 to 127 is half of those tones, because again, 0 is 1, so this is 128 tones. Uh, and then from 128 to 255 is also 128 tones. That means that middle gray is actually 127 and a half. You can't have 127 and a half. So what ends up happening in Photoshop is that they actually had to decide. It's either going to be 127 or it was going to be 128. But this introduces what they call rounding errors in Photoshop because you do not have a perfect middle gray. And this impacts the stuff that we do as far as blending modes specifically. Um, it doesn't show up very quickly, um, but if you start doing a lot of tonal and tonal and tonal and tonal and tonal, whatever, eventually these rounding errors uh, can creep up and uh, bite you in the ass. However, <clears throat> if we suck this blending mode, so I'm going to take my top layer right here, the background copy, and I'm going to change the blending mode from normal to multiply. And you see that my image gets darker. Why is that? If I'm taking 100, can anybody whip out a calculator really quick on your phone? 128 times 128 equals what? 16,384. That should be pure white because 255 is white. But it isn't. It's not only doesn't get lighter, it actually gets darker. Did anybody ever wonder why that is? 
Okay, so this is why that is. Let me see, because you guys can't see this green. Let me go get a black marker really quick. <laughs> we have an option of blue or red. Blue, I'll take. Is this good for whiteboard, though? It's an expert marker, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. <laughs> Say what? Do you have officers tomorrow? Say what? Do you have officers tomorrow? Or are you going I, no, I do. Okay. Uh, somebody's going to be there at 1. Come later. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Oh, perfect, because it's a big one. All right, good, thanks. Uh, okay, so here's the deal. If you look at um, a 16-bit image in Photoshop, a 16-bit image theoretically has um, 32,000 possible tones uh, in a grayscale and in the billions of tones for color. Uh, when we get to 32-bit, which you actually can't have in Photoshop, 32-bit, the scale is so large, I, people, I don't even know how you pronounce the number that, did we look at bit depths here before? Let me just jump in here really quick. Hopefully I'll have this. So this is the bit depth. If you take a look down here at the bottom, uh, you have for just a grayscale, one channel in 32-bit, it's 4 billion, 294, blah, 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 blah. But look at the number of colors that you have. That's what you have in 32-bit. Can you imagine your readout trying to show you that? It just wouldn't work, right? I mean, it's just it's too big of a number. If somebody said, oh, can you give me middle gray in here? the fuck would the number be? You would never know, right? So instead what they do is when they reach, um, uh, when you reach 32-bit, they abandon all of this together and they go from a scale of zero to one, which is basically zero to 100%. That's basically what they do. So in 32-bit, what ends up happening is that middle gray in 32-bit is 0 0.5. Zero is zero. And one is the equivalent of white. One would be the same as 255. Does that make sense? So in our little readout guy here, you can change the readout of this second uh, point in your info palette. Come up to the number two point, click on the drop down menu, and come down. And instead of, and you can see it right here, in 8 bit, you've got a scale of 0 to 255. In 16-bit, you've got a scale of 0 to 3,768. But in 32-bit, it goes from 0 to 1. And if you click on that, you'll see that if, again, we're going to take our multiply back to just a normal blending mode, that this number 2 point right here is actually a 0 0.502. The reason you have that 02 in the end is, again, because you cannot have a perfect middle gray in a, in a, in a binary world. It doesn't exist because you can only have even numbers. So. When we look at the addition of whole numbers, and whole numbers are basically 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's a whole number, right? So if we look at addition, so I'm going to do the four possible uh, 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 mathematical modifiers. Uh, so uh, we have addition, we have subtraction, we have multiply, and divide. And in whole numbers, and fractions. So in whole numbers, addition will always increase your numbers, right? 2 plus 2 is 4. 1 plus 2 is 3. 7 plus 5 is 12. The number that results will always be greater in addition with the whole number. Make sense? Same thing that happens in fractions. In fractions, if you have a half plus a half, you have 1. If you have a quarter plus a quarter, you have a half. Does that make sense? So again, fractions are always increase as well. In subtraction, in whole numbers, if you subtract one whole number from another, you always decrease the number. It's always less. So again, 2 minus 1 is 1. 5 minus 3 is 2. 
So it's always less. Same thing that happens in fractions. In fractions, when you subtract one fraction from another, they actually decrease. So when you subtract a quarter from a half, you end up with a quarter. It's always a decrease. In multiplication, in whole numbers, when you multiply two numbers together, they always increase. It's always a positive value. It always goes up, right? So two, plus, two times three is six, or six times one is six. Six times seven is 42. And it always is increase, right? So this is a plus. In divide, the up for whole numbers, I'm not going to move to fractions yet, but in dividing in whole numbers, it's actually the, um, uh, you'll always have a decrease. So again, if you have nine divided by three, it'll be three if you've got, uh, you know, yeah, on and on and on. So it's always a minus. However, when you get to multiplication of fractions, it does not work that way. In multiplication of fractions, these two reverse. So for instance, if you take a half times a half, you, ink, you end up with a quarter. That's what it ends up equaling. So multiplication of fractions, you actually end up with less, not more. Does that make sense? And division is the exact opposite of this. Again, if you were to divide one half by one half, it equals one. So it's an increase here. These actually flip. So what happens in blending mode math is that Photoshop uses the 32-bit scale. It uses this scale. So when you multiply this 0.502 times 0.502 by changing this blending mode to multiply, you end up getting exactly what we are talking about here. And you'll see this changes to a 0.251, exactly what those two multiplied together would equal. Does that make sense? So that's basically the way blending mode math works. If you look at the blending modes here, um, what you end up with is the ones up here at normal and dissolve actually don't change anything. Uh, or, or they, don't, they don't apply any of this math. In the darkening group, you start with multiply. There's a whole series of different algorithms that are run on this, but they ultimately end up darkening your image. There are variations on this multiply. If you go to the lightning group, which is the group right down here, what they do in lightning group is they take the result of the opposite of the lightning group. So the opposite of screen is multiply. So if you were to set our, this blending mode right now to screen instead of multiply, you'll see that the image gets lighter. What they do, the way the math for this works, is that they actually take, they do the darkening move first. So they would do multiply, which is the opposite of screen, and then they take that result and they subtract it from one. So you remember, in our case, multiply, when we had multiply on there, was a 0.251. They take one and they subtract it from that, and you end up with a 0.7. 753. So that's pretty much how the darkening group works for this part right in here. I mean the lightning group. So darkening group, lightning group. And this group right in here, this is the contrast group. And in the contrast group, what you've actually got is, if again we stick with multiply and screen, it's uh, the equivalent of the, or they're the operators that function in soft light. And what happens in soft light is, and you guys already know it because you do this all the time with your dodging and burning. Anything that is 50% gray in soft light is neutral. It has no effect on your image. Anything that is darker is actually darkened and anything that's lighter is actually lightened. What ends up happening is, is that they take, um, they, uh, anything that's darker in your image and 50% is multiplied and anything that is lighter is actually uh, screened. Then down to hard light, again, anything lighter than 50% gray is actually a color burn. Anything that's darker than 50% gray is a color dodge. And then on and on, these things match up with these guys all the way down. And they're all based on the darkening group to begin with. And then finally, we get down to difference and exclusion, hue saturation. These guys, we are not going to deal with. We might deal a little bit with this guy later on, but uh, for the most part. So it's just to give you guys some idea of what's going on in the blending mode groups. Again, it is a relationship between the base layer and the, and the blend layer. There is math that is run between these two, and the result of that equation is what you see. Are we good on that? See, it wasn't that bad better than your math class this afternoon. 
Um, okay, so we are going to go back into calculations again today. But I've got a present for you guys that I'm hoping will work. I have not installed this in my Photoshop CC yet, and I don't think they're installed on these. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to do it right now. Uh, you have to quit Photoshop to do this. I'm going to not save that. And in the folder for today, oh, actually, I take that back. Let me do this. I'm going to go over homework really quick, the stuff you guys turned in. I just want to look at a couple things really quick. We'll take a break, and then we'll jump into this other stuff. Okay. Uh, we're not going to look at tons today. We're going to look at the stuff you guys turned in. So uh, for the most part, uh, this went reasonably well. There's two ways to actually do this retouch, um, both of which happened in this class, which is also a good thing. Um, the one way to do it, and I think I'm looking at Caitlin's right here. Yeah, and it was how she did hers. Um, was By and large, it was a whole series of, of taking different parts of different images to create patches to end up um, uh, taking all the wrinkling out of the body. So what ends up happening though, I told a lot of people, and uh, she was not the only one, but I told, because it, I, this, I ended up uh, copying and pasting this critique into a lot of this stuff. Um, what ended up happening here is if we zoom in on this at the end, whatever, you see that there's a lot of still a lot of tonal variation that's happening in here, uh, especially little pockets like this, some weird little shit that's happening there. Um, the easiest way to fix that was simply to put a large tonal retouching layer on here and dot, dot, dot your way out of this. So again, like you can see a line that's right here that really shouldn't be there. There's a little bit of lightness here. Again, small retouching layer. Again, you would sample the color of this suit to have your dodging and burning colors to actually do that. But the other thing that happened to a lot of people was there was this seam issue, and you can see it right here. You can see that there's a seam that starts along here, and all of a sudden it disappears, and then it comes back for a little bit, um, and then it comes around to here. There were a lot of people who ended up with what I call ghosted seams, and I don't see, yep, I do see one. Here, there's a mismatch right here. It's not really a ghosted seam. I'll show you another ghosted seam later. But this is something that you could actually think about doing. Um, I always uh, thought that this was a really smart way to deal with retouching. Once you get all of your retouching done and everything looks great the way you want it to look, I'm going to select the very top layer, uh, make it active, and I'm going to do a merge stamp version into that. So Command, Option, Shift, and hit the letter E. This is now all of my retouching has been done up here. If I turn off all the other layers except for the one at the very bottom, then I've got a single layer that represents all of my retouching. You can put a layer mask on this. I'm going to put an opaque layer mask on this guy for mine right here. And then you could actually sit in front of a client and say, you want to know how skilled I am at retouching? Watch this. I can do this. And I can take all of that out. And isn't that amazing? I'm that good. But then they think, well, you're that fast and they shouldn't be paying you anything anyway. So that's not a way to do it. But nonetheless, the real reason I do this is to fix the work exactly what was happening. So you remember if we were, if we go back, I'm just going to snapshot this really quick. If we look at Katie's right here, I mean, Caitlin's right here, this is, this is where the problem is right here. We lose that seam right here. So if we go to my snapshot right here, you can see that there's this edge. The retouching is edge right here. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I've got a completely hard brush. I do. Uh, I'll pass the 100% normal blending mode, whatever. I'm going to zoom in on this guy. And I'm simply going to paint along. I'm going to paint my correction so that it butts up against the old seam that actually was happening in there and keeping the old seam. So it's just a way to keep the obvious edge that was actually in there. But does that make sense what I'm doing here? Yeah, I thought it would. 
so at any rate, it's just a way to um, sort of have the best of both because there was nothing ever wrong with any of the edge. That part was never a problem here. Uh, but some people in, in what they ended up doing, either distorting stuff or whatever, uh, ended up uh, kicking back, uh, ended up uh, losing this edge. So again, I'll do one more snapshot. And this is the difference in where Caitlin was here and where I am now here. And it's her retouching. So it's just a way to think about doing that. Uh, okay, we'll take a look at Taylor's really quick because there is a ghosted <laughs> seam in hers. Again, we lose the whole seam there. This is a ghosted seam right here. It's this guy right here. And the same trick that I just used on Caitlin's would actually get rid of that guy as well. It would be the same retouch. Take a look at Elizabeth's next. Um, this was just really well done. She gets into a little trouble down in the seam part right in here, but for the most part, this part was extremely well done. So, and I don't know, let me see if Elizabeth did hers this way, I don't remember. Yeah, you can see in her case, she's actually got uh, quite a bit going on here. She does, definitely gets into a, a very serious tonal retouch on hers. Um, this is her masking part. Hers is still comprised largely, it looks like, of um, patches of uh, fabric from other uh, images and also from the, um, uh, she did some pixel retouching and then she comes up here and it looks like this is more just little pixel work that she's actually doing here. Ari, on the other hand, did it the way, and when I very first did this file, Puppet Warp didn't exist but it does now and that's how Ari actually did his and I've done this a gazillion times since then and it's by far I think the best way of doing this uh, is to actually puppet warp this guy as a matter of fact we may do that really quickly here in class just to see but I'll show it to you really quickly what his looks like so he starts his out um, and it's right in here yeah and you can see this is what he does so this is actually what he's done is he's actually taken this image, the one that was used for the stomach part, whatever, and <clears throat> he stretched it out so that <clears throat> so that he actually maps the two frames together. Because when I shot this thing, um, I was hand holding this. So there's very little of those frames that are really exactly in register, um, but the puppet warping allows him to actually change it. You can see that's the suit. As a matter of fact, I'll turn off. Well, it's easier to see with the mask on. Uh, the mask has got this on, but now if you turn the puppet warping on, you can see that it, he actually, it, it pulls, you know, again, it allows him to line up the seams along the crotch and along the, uh, uh, along the sides, the whole nine yards. Uh, it's just the easier way to go about doing it now. And Sydney took hers in some ways to the next level. One of the issues that you guys, and I didn't get too hard on you guys about doing this, um, how many of you guys uh, color balanced and then ran that color balance on all the raw files before you did anything? Yeah, good job. I knew it happened in some, you could see it in some, and it didn't happen in others, and I wasn't going to be that hard-ass about it. But it was the first thing to do. It's why I left you that file in there. Um, so again, and in Sydney's case, she actually gets into a situation where she is, starts to do color correction on these guys as well. She does a, I'm guessing this is a, yeah, she's desaturating this a little bit to take some of that uh, purple cast out of it. Um, and let's see what if I can, and the curve is just to lighten it up a little bit. Um, but it was in just a nice extra touch on top of that. And then finally, Samantha's, this was an interesting twist, which she did on hers. Um, I don't necessarily think it worked. But it was an interesting spin, nonetheless. So in her case, Wait, you wanted us to get rid of the 
rhinestones? If you look at the sample image, there's no rhinestones. That seems rough to me. Um, so anyway, what she did that I thought was interesting is, is that she actually put, and I don't know that she uses it. I'm going to turn these guys off. She puts on a layer effect, and it's a satin layer effect. Um, how many people in this room do not know what layer effects are, blending layer effects are? You've all done some of them, right? Drop shadows, that kind of stuff, right? Well, one of them is allows you to actually introduce texture and it's this one right here. So again, you've got your blending options right here, the uh, bevel and emboss contour texture, all that kind of stuff, whatever. She actually adds a satin texture to hers. Uh, I think what she was trying to do, she was trying to reintroduce some of the texture that got lost. Because you can see, like here, this is a perfect example. This is why you don't retouch skin using pixel, uh, doing pixel work, is this stuff ends up blending so much together that you end up losing the texture. The texture of the suit that's alive here is no longer here at all, even if I turn, and you can see, so what I think she was trying to do was reintroduce that. I don't think it worked, but it was a good, I, I liked the way she was thinking, I guess is all I'm trying to say about this. What I would do to fix this, if this became an issue for me, is I would get this thing as far as I could possibly get it. Then I would again do another merge stamp version of this. So we'll actually do this on hers. I would do a merge stamp version of this. And then in this layer right here, I would start to do split frequency work. And I would use areas of here that actually had texture in them and replace areas here that didn't have that texture in it to reintroduce it. Make sense? So uh, that happened, and a couple of you guys also it happened. There were areas up in here, it's not actually in hers, but there was areas up in here where this highlight just completely went, it just got completely blown out, it went to white. Um, and it would be a way to introduce texture back into that would be to, uh, again, use split frequency work to try to do that part. So, but for the most part, you guys did a pretty good job on that. Could you stop your sign-in list, please? Thanks. Um, okay. Okay, so we do still have time really quickly to show you the thing I'm hoping to give you because I'm hoping this works. Every time they release a new version of Photoshop, um, I run the risk of this no longer working. So I'm gonna quit Photoshop. Inside your folder for today, it's either today or it may have been for last week, but I'll look here really quick. And this was last week. Yeah. Okay, so look in your week 12. You can try doing that on this mach on your machines here. I don't know if they're going to let you do it. This um, may actually already be installed on your machine. I'm not really sure, but we'll see what it is. There is a series of files inside this, depending on the version of Photoshop you're working on. Is anybody working still in uh, CS6? So pretty much all of you are at least some version of CC now. Okay, so that would be then you want to use this folder up here, this CC14 right here. There is a PDF in here that describes what it is or how to actually use it, how to set this up, how to actually get this going for you. Uh, I already know how to do it, so I'm actually going to do it to mine right here. I'm going to go into my application folder. I'm going to find uh, my Photoshop CC2017, which is right here. Inside 2017, there's a plugin folder. I'm going to open that plugin folder up. And then you want to take this optional, this guy right here, this optional multi plugin plugin, you want to copy that into this plugin folder. So again, don't just take it out of there, actually make a copy of it. So uh, you have to do this with Photoshop off. You can do it with Photoshop on, but you'll have to restart Photoshop to get this thing to work. So that's the first step that you actually want to do. And then the next step, go ahead and start Photoshop up. The one that's called optional multi plugin plugin. You just drag it into the plugins folder. But in my case, I hold down the option key to make a copy of it because you want to keep a copy of it on your hard drive. OK, so that these machines are locked down. So you guys aren't going to be able to do it to these machines, but you'll be able to do it to your laptop at home. So then once you get into Photoshop, we need to load an action. To load an action, you come over to the action palette. 
you click on the drop down menu and in the drop down menu you actually click on load actions and you navigate to that very same folder so again it was in retouching <coughs> retouch, 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 retouching and class 12 in the student folder in the separate channel action here and it's this guy right here the separate channels action that's the set of actions that you want to actually load and you go ahead and say open to that and you will see depending on where you put them they will sit right down here at the bottom and it's called all channels Does that make sense okay finally i am going to open up the file that we worked on last week when we were doing calculations I'm going to open this guy up in Photoshop. Now, when you use this action, when you actually run this guy, you do not want to have any, you want a virgin copy of your, layer of, of your file. You don't want to have any, you don't want to have saved any channels down here. You don't want to have saved any selections. You don't want multiple layers in here. You don't want adjustment layers in here. You want this as bare bones as you can possibly get. I'm not even certain that this will work on a smart object. If it doesn't work on a smart object, simply copy the file and rasterize it. Once this thing does its trick, um, then you can open up another copy of your smart object without any problem. But, so you see what I've got going on right here, right? And I've got a single file that's got a red, green, and a blue channel in it. I'm going to now run this uh, all channels and, and cross your fingers. So you remember last week when I said to you guys that you don't only need to work with an RGB uh, copy of your file in calculations, that you can actually use, uh, well, in our case, we actually made a copy. Of, as a matter of fact, open this file up really quick because we'll go ahead and do this because um, we still have time. Again, I loaded from that very same folder, the one that's called Separate Actions, the, the one that's CC 2014. So the two folders, are there's two files in there that matter. There's the plugin that you need to plug in. There's the action that you need to load. Uh, and then there's a PDF in there explaining all of it. But look at what this guy has now done for us. I have now got my original, I've got two files here. I've got my original one that's got the RGB in it. But I've got a second one here and look at the channels that this has made for me. If you look at the top, I've got an HSL, what does that stand for? Shoe saturation lightness, and this is the luminance channel for it right here. As a matter of fact, if you drag your, this guy to make it a little bit wider, you'll see the full names of this. So this is the luminosity of an HSL image. This is the HSL blue channel, the HSL green one, the HSL red one. This is the HSB luminosity, which is different than HSL luminosity. Um, that to the side and keep cranking down then down here we've got the hsb blue channel the hsl green channel the hsb red channel we've now got an lab set of channels in here that is the luminosity of lab that is the b channel of lab this is the a channel of lab this is the cmyk luminosity channel the grayscale of it this is the black channel this is the yellow channel the magenta channel and the cyan channel you have got all of these that are now available for you to actually use when you're doing calculations. And if you look at the action that I just gave you and the complexity of this action, it goes really quick on mine, but you'll see how insanely crazy this is. If this opens up, there's all sorts of things inside of here, whatever. It does all the work for you, uh, and it just it's an amazing thing to actually work with. So what I wanted to do really quick is um, I'm going to close this guy up. We're simply, I'm going to do this really quick with you guys just to make sure that you figure out, again, just to get you a quick refresher and then we'll take a break. We can do this in 10 minutes. I know we can. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, if you've got this file open, you do have it open, right? Okay, make a... It's doing what? We'll close this guy first. Then you maybe want to try it on this guy. Move over to here. Don't, or move over to this guy. Oh, so just double clicking on the action actually loaded it into Photoshop? Yeah. Was Photoshop had to be open then, right? Yeah. Okay, anyway, so here, guys, come on. I said we're going to have 10 minutes and you've already wasted three of them. Okay. 
I know, right? Okay, so up to the image menu, down to duplicate. We want a copy of this image, and I'm just going to call this CMYK. And say okay to that. Then I'm going to come up to the image menu again, down to mode, and then change this so that it is in CMYK. Because right now, even though I named it CMYK, it's still an RGB image. So I'm up to image, down to mode, down to CMYK, and this will give me that warning that it's going to use the swap profile to do it. And I'm going to say okay, uh, and it changes this now, and you can see that I've got uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So when we originally did the calculation, again, remember what we were doing. Go back to your RGB version of this file. What we were doing up on my board right here, we're going to look at really quickly was in calculations, we have source one and source two. Source one is the helper. Source two is the hero. And so what we did when we were looking at our original RGB guy right here, um, we look through the red channel, and again, what you're looking for in the hero is you're looking for the best channel that you can use that if you could only pick one channel, that's the hero. So it's the strongest one if you could only use one. The advantage of calculations is that we can do multiple channels. That's the whole idea behind it. But so looking for the hero here, and for me, I know that the hardest part is going to be the hair. So the red channel, even though it has good skin separation, it blows in the hair. So this is not my hero. If I look at the green channel, it's even worse. It sucks on the skin and the hair both. Blue channel is it. So the blue channel was my hero. And then again, the decision to invert this or not has to do with what we ultimately want in the end. So the mask that I want in the end, where I see the girl and I don't see the background, is the girl going to be white or black in that mask? White, right? So in this case, her hair is really dark. I need that hair to be white, so I have to invert the blue channel. So this is blue inverted. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the only tricky part in this thing, in my opinion. Well, not the only tricky part, but anyway. So that's going to be uh, how my hero is set up. Then again, for the helper, I looked in around for somebody that's actually going to help out. So what's weak in here that I don't have? Well, I don't have any of the skin in here, and I do have the skin in the red channel. So I can use the red channel as my helper. But the red channel, do I invert this guy or not? Why don't I invert it? Because the skin is already white, or it's already on the lighter side. If I inverted this, it would be, well, this is what it looks like inverted. It would be dark, and that's not what I want. Okay, so I'm going to run calculations according to that. Up to the RGB uh, guy, up to image, down to calculations. And we're going to set it up exactly the way it's sitting up here on the board. So I do have the red channel. The red channel is going to be my uh, helper right here. It is not inverted. And then for the source two, the hero on this, it's going to be the blue channel, and it is going to be inverted. And then you simply go through the blending modes to find out which is the best one to give you ultimately the image that you want. And again, what I care about is the edge of this hair, so that's what I'm going to actually look at right here. So as I'm going through these guys one at a time, I'm looking at it. It's none of the darker set. Either darker color or lighter color make no difference at all. All they do is pick which of the two channels is either darker or lighter, and you've already got the two. So they don't change your image at all. They don't change the channels at all. But screen would be my next one. Color dodge is my next one. I'm actually thinking that color dodge is what we ended up going. No, maybe not. Uh, linear dodge, actually, it doesn't help me. So far, color dodge is the one. Lighter color won't help me at all. Overlay, possible. Soft light, a weaker version of overlay, no reason. Hard light possible vivid light vivid light starts actually getting interesting but i'm nervous about the quality of this uh, edge line on her hair right here so you can use the preview button to go on and off and see are you really keeping the feathery part of that, that hair and i feel like i actually am keeping the feathering part of that hair so i'm going to keep vivid light is so far the leader in my opinion linear light would be the next one all linear light does is bring more detail back into the body uh, it doesn't actually change that hair, I don't think. Go back between these two. No. Uh, pin light and hard mix are not going to do it. So it's going to be vivid light, and I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that. So if I double click on the hand, 
it'll kick back out. So this is the first channel that actually got made just using RGB. But we are now going to then try a different version of this. So I'm going to come back up to the RGB at the top and I'm going to then look at my CMYK version, at my CMYK channels. So I'm looking at Cyan right here, and Cyan in its own way is far more complete. You remember the red channel that we had going. You can compare the two. If you go back into your RGB guy and click on red, you can leave red on showing, and then you can look at Cyan, and you can see that <clears throat> even though they're supposed to be the complementary color of one another, they're not the exact opposite of one another. But there's another weird thing going on here. How come they're both light? I would have thought that cyan would have been, if red is on the lighter side, that cyan would have actually been on the darker side because it's a complementary color. Why isn't it? This is the reason why. In RGB, we're used to looking at the channel. So if we go back into RGB guy and look at it, what this really, what we're looking at here is the mask that controls the amount of red light that shows up in this image. Does that make sense? So it controls the red light that's actually coming through. So if you imagine shining a red light onto a wall and putting this mask in front of it, in the skin area, we would let in a whole lot of red, right? Because skin has got a lot of red in it, right? Does that sort of make sense? Okay. In this part over here, though, in our CMYK version of this, again, if you actually uh, sort of hover over this part here in our CMYK, let's actually get a CMYK readout. There's one that's happening right up here. You'll look at the CMYK readout here as I'm hovering over this, and you can see, I'll stick here, I'll st stay here in my four, four color image right here. You can see how much, how little uh, C, I've only got 3% C that's coming in here. This actually is controlling the plate for ink. And so what happens is, is that when the plate is exposed to this, or a printing plate is exposed to this, it actually exposes this quite hard because it lets through a whole lot of light, which in turn restricts the ink that actually comes through. Does that make sense? So it's a mask, but it's the flip side of it. If, it, if that makes any sense to you guys. So that's why they both end up being light. Again, this is subtractive. The other one is additive. And the reason these masks are both on the lighter tone is because they are in two completely different color modes. One is an additive mode, and that is letting through a whole lot. The other is a subtractive mode. So this is subtracting a lot, and that's what's happening here. OK, so anyway. So I'm looking at Cyan right here. I think Cyan is actually going to be my new hero. I'm going to look at Magenta. does nothing for me. Yellow is a possibility in here. Um, I'm going to compare my yellow to my blue in this one and say which one of these is actually looks better. And in my case, I feel like there's more contrast between the yellow in the background and the hair than there is in the, um, uh, the um, uh, blue channel that's in the background. I'm going to come in and take a look at the quality of that edge hair, though, at this part right here. And I'm going to do the same thing in this blue channel right here. And again, I feel like the yellow is actually a better aid for me right here. So I am going to double click on the hand and I'm going to change this now. So cyan in my case is going to be my hero now. Is that hero inverted or not? So it's cyan and then my helper in here is going to be yellow. And is the yellow channel inverted? It is, right? Because this is what the yellow guy looks like. So the yellow is inverted. So we're going to go back into our RGB file. Click on the RGB at the top, up to the image, down to calculations, and set it up the way this guy is set up right here. So yellow is the top. To get to the yellow, we need to change the source image from the RGB version to the CMYK version. That then gives us the availability to get to those channels. And I'm going to pick the yellow channel, and I am going to invert it. And then on my source number two, I'm also going to the CMYK version of the file. And then for its channel, I'm picking cyan, and it is not inverted. 
And I'm going to take my blending mode all the way back up to the top to darken. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can see this. So that's darken, multiply, color burn. You would be shocked at how good multiply could actually be in this case right here. I've got a lot of fineness in here. It's separating from the background, but I'm hopefully I've got something better. Anyway, color burn kills that line. Linear burn kills that hairline, would never use it. Darker color doesn't matter. Lighten actually starts to get me to a place. I've got better, I think, but it gets me to some place. Screen. Screen actually cleans up a little bit more, but I'm still nervous about that background being that light. Color dodge cleans out even more. The background is a little bit darker now. Linear dodge. Color dodge was better. Finally, overlay. Overlay starts to be interesting in here. Again, I'm going to check out the quality of the hair on this feathery part. So far, overlay is the winner so far. Soft light is a weaker version of that. No reason to use it. Hard light should be a stronger version of this. And again, I've got to check the quality of the edge of that hair. So, so far, somebody write this down really quick. I've either got... Uh, in my case, it was, it was overlay and hard light are my two options so far. So, again, I always have a pad of paper next to me when I'm doing this kind of work, just so I can jot this down really quickly. Uh, vivid light. Vivid light killed that whole hairline right there, so that's not it. Linear light makes it just as bad. Pen light and hard mix will, they rarely, if ever, will do anything. Um, so it's the difference between hard light and overlay. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I didn't see any change on the edge at all. Uh, hard light actually brings in a whole lot more tone into her skin. There's no reason to do that. So overlays the guy. I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that. And then we can look at the difference in our two uh, channels that we've actually got going right here and decide which of these is actually better. I would, um, and I've done this uh, before, um, I would go ahead and go finish this up. I would run uh, levels on this guy to go ahead and clean them out. Um, in the end, what I have found, and you can sort of see it up here, next to this part of her hair right here, that the first one that we made from the RGB guy, uh, only the RGB channels, it ends up being you sort of like lose the really fine feathery detail in the hair right here. Whereas if you do the alpha, the one that we actually did using the CMYK versions, you see you keep little bits of this feathery hair right here. The mask that you end up building using the CMYK for this file ends up being a finer mask, in my opinion, than the ones from the uh, RGB file. Make sense? Um, and then finally, the last thing to know about doing this is that you can actually do your calculations in either the CMYK file or the RGB file, but you would always want to do it in the RGB one because you, you want to save your RGB file. You would never want to save your, a CMYK version of your file over the RGB version. The CMYK color space is way, 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 way too small to do that. Make sense? Questions? Okay, guys, let's do a quick... Um, I've got one after eight. Let's get back by a quarter after, and we will do our, I think this is our last assignment for this class today. Sad, huh? It's our last working anything. We may do something next week. I don't know. It depends on where you guys are. There are no more assignments for this class other than uh, working on your um, uh, final project.